What's up guys and welcome to One Take. Today we're talking about Dark Season 3 Episode 7 titled Between the Time. This video will of course have spoilers through Episode 7, but I have not yet watched the finale to Season 3, so no spoilers for Episode 8. Before we jump into it, just a quick reminder to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we go live. Let's get into the episode, but first, I'm Gil, and I'm here with my brother Daniel. Hey, thank you for having me. I brought Daniel on because this is a complex show dealing with all sorts of crazy science, and Daniel, you majored in what? Uh, physics and neuroscience. So we have a genius with us today, so he's going to help break down the episode. Overall, I thought this was another great episode. It filled in a lot of gaps in the timeline, stuff that we'd heard about but hadn't seen firsthand yet. And it was a complicated episode in one sense because it jumped around a lot. But in another sense, it was actually sort of a straightforward episode because it was just going through the motions, getting us to the place where we know where we end up. To me, it felt like a series of short glimpses into these awesome little movies, which was good in one sense, but also tough because I wish we could have spent more time in some of these scenarios. The relationship between Noah and Elizabeth, the friendship between Jonas and Noah that's very short-lived, and Bartosz and Celia. I feel like we got enough from each of these to feel the impact of the story and buy everything that we saw, but I wanted more. Daniel, what did you think of the episode? Do you agree with all that? Anything you'd add? Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I think there were a lot of things I would have loved to get more time with. I think right. one thing I mentioned, especially during the episode, was re like basically Jonas's transition, right, from Jonas to Adam. Yeah. Like we we understand like how it happened, but it felt like we could have spent a lot more time like right. experiencing Agreed. it. Agreed. This was an eight episode season, so was season two. Season one was ten episodes. I think the season could have benefited from a couple more. But that's sort of like complaining that it was so good, I wish we could have had more of it. By the way, I want to mention at the top of this video that last episode or my review of last episode, episode six, I was wrong. I made a mistake when I talked about the multiple Martas. Because, of course, you have Eva, you have middle-aged Marta, but in the previous episode, we had three young Martas running around. There was the one that was trapped in the cage with Adam. There was the one scrambling around hours before the apocalypse in 2019, and there was the one with the scar that killed Jonas. I thought that all three of them were the same person from different points in the timeline. Turns out I was wrong about that. But we're going to circle back to that at the end of this video when we revisit the Marta that's currently trapped with Adam. With that, let's jump into the recap. The episode began in the Prime World in 1974, or we assume it's the Prime World. I think we had no reason to think that it's the alternate world. Nevertheless, we start in 1974 with H.G. Tonhaus, and he's talking about Schrodinger's cat. Now, I'm wondering, Daniel, if you had the same reaction that I did when it opened on pure black, except for a little box, and you hear the narration talking about multiple realities, I thought that Adam ended the world, and this was going to be some weird, well, that reality got destroyed, but let's check in on another reality. Then it turned out we cut to H.G. Townhouse, maybe recording a video or almost teaching a class or something. I'm wondering if you had the same reaction I did. I don't think I didn't start running with this idea that like reality ended and this was some explanation of another reality. I did just think it was like really cool. Right. And it kind of broke the norm of how the show usually starts out. Right, right. And just briefly, Schrodinger's cat is essentially a thought experiment where a cat is in a box with some radioactive material that could kill the cat. And until we open the box to see whether or not the cat is alive, it exists in both states simultaneously. Kind of like how Jonas both was killed and continues to exist simultaneously. As Townhouse is giving his narration about multiple realities, we look at a moment we've now seen multiple times. 2020 Prime World where the apocalypse is about to hit. Marta has just perished and Jonas gets rescued by Marta from the alternate world. If you recall, in the last episode, Magnus and Francisca came from the future, grabbed Alt Marta, and recruited her to Adam's cause. They told her, you need to go rescue Jonas and bring him to your world. So she's about to do exactly that, except 
This time, Barcho shows up from the alternate world and stops her from going in. He says, Adam lied to you. He makes the apocalypse happen, but I know the origin. I know how it's all connected. Come with me. We have a split screen where on one side, Marta goes in and rescues Jonas, and on the other side, she doesn't. Instead, she goes with Bartosz. At this point, I almost laugh every time one of the characters says, so-and-so lied to you, because this happens so many times. Adam tells you something, no, he was lying. Noah tells you something, no. Claudia tells you something, no, she was lying. So we've seen it so many times, we had to get in at least one more before the series wraps up. Going back to Townhouse, he visits the grave for his son, his daughter-in-law, and his granddaughter. We see their names, Merrick, Sonia, and Charlotte. The narration goes on about how we all have a desire to turn back time and reverse death. So this is motivation for Townhouse to start building a time machine. And over the narration, we hear a person is able to pursue a goal, no matter how unattainable it may seem over the course of an entire lifetime. No resistance, no obstacles great enough to stop one from pursuing one's will. And this distinguishes us from animals who only have short-term desires. First off, when I heard this narration, I found that super motivating. Until the next line later in the episode, a man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills, which I thought was a pretty brilliant line. And it essentially explains the Jonas Adam transition because Jonas keeps looking at Adam, this villain thinking I'll never do what he does. And the fact of the matter is if Jonas doesn't want to be Adam, he doesn't have to be, but eventually he will want to be Adam and he will want to do the things that Adam does. You can do what you will, but you can't will what you will. Anyway, Townhouse is building the time machine. We have a montage of him building and building. This began in 1974, and then the next time the clock shows up, before we transition, it says 1986. About 12 years goes by while he's building this time machine. He's made a lot of progress on the machine. Townhouse goes to turn it on, and a sort of fiery globe appears in the middle of it. This whole sequence in the episode is pretty confusing because we're watching Townhouse build a time machine, whereas in season two and season one, we saw Claudia deliver blueprints to Townhouse. We saw Jonas bring him a time machine, so he didn't build his own time machine. My thought was that this could be before the cycles all started. Presumably, before this ever-repeating cycle that we watched in seasons one and two, there had to be a time where Townhouse wrote the book A Journey Through Time, where he built his own time machine. Then at the end of the cycle, somebody took the knowledge of that time machine, they took the book, Claudia, Jonas got involved, they brought it back to the beginning, to the point where Townhouse didn't have to build a time machine to begin with, and thus the cycle began, the bootstrap paradox came into play. Perhaps what we're seeing here is before this whole cyclical thing started, this is the first cycle, so to speak. Townhouse is building the machine himself. Maybe this is the true origin. We keep talking about finding the origin point. I think right here we're getting a glimpse of it, but luckily we don't have to wait long to find out because I'm assuming this will be resolved in the final episode. That's all we see of Townhouse in this episode. From there, we cut to 1890, where Jonas is still working on the God Particle Machine. He gets zapped in the arm, which leaves a pretty bad burn. And I think that gives us a little glimpse into how he's going to eventually look like Adam. These sorts of burns and disfigurements. Bartosz gets frustrated. He starts yelling at Jonas, We've been here for two years. He accuses Jonas of not wanting to stop the apocalypse. Jonas says, this is bigger than us, this is bigger than the apocalypse. When the portal opens, we can find the origin and destroy it. That is paradise. Bartosz says he doesn't want paradise, he just wants to get out of here. Bartosz leaves, he goes for a walk, and in the woods, we see Sylvia arrive from the future. She changes into 1800s garb, and then a love story begins. And one thing this show is great at is showing two characters meet, 
and just communicating the feelings on their faces when one gets a crush on the other, for example. The first time Elizabeth and Noah met, I could just tell something was happening there. Or the first time Charlotte and Peter meet. And then this moment where Bartosz meets Silja for the first time, you can just see the connection form in their faces. And this was one of those stories where I would have loved to have spent more time with it, the bartosh Silja love story. Anyway, fast forward from 1890, about 14 years to 1904, Bartosz and Silja are together, and she gives birth to a baby that they named Hanno which we know is actually Noah. At that point, Bartosz's face, I thought I saw a change in his expression because I think this is the moment where he realizes he is moving along the predetermined path that he saw so many years earlier, or technically many years in the future. But I think that Bartosz knows the name Hanno Tauber, and he knows that this baby is Noah. And he realizes that this is the beginning of Sigmundus. And from that point forward, we don't really see Bartosz fight with Jonas again. And I think he's essentially resigned himself to the life that he knows he's going to lead. And he becomes, like everybody else, a sort of tragic figure because he knows this baby is going to become Noah and spend his entire life dedicated to the Sigmundus cause. We fast forward again from 1904 to 1910, where Sylvia gives birth to Noah's sister and she dies during childbirth. The woman who assisted in the birth when Bartos shows up, she tells Bartos that Sylvia wanted to name the baby Agnes. And at the mention of the name Agnes, Bartosz looks at Hanno, looks at Noah, and he again has that look of realization on his face. And I think it's just him again reflecting that he's along this predetermined path. Fast forward one year to 1911, and Bartosz gets a visit from Hannah. Hannah arrives with her and Egon's child, who we know will grow up to be Celia. She has the same scar on her face. And Hannah sees Bartosz, who brings her to meet with Jonas. And at this moment, watching the episode, I had to reflect on how crazy it is how far we've come from where we started. At the beginning of all this, they were in high school. We watched Marta perform in the Ariadne play. There were antics in high school. They were smoking pot. And now Hannah has traveled back in time to 1911 with a child who will eventually grow up to get with Bartosz, who will give birth to Noah, etc. It's just crazy to look at where we've ended up. Anyway, Bartosz escorts Hannah to meet with her son. On the way there, he warns Hannah that Jonas has changed. Traveling has left its mark. As soon as we heard that, I knew that what we were about to see was going to be a prototype Adam or a Jonas that looks a lot more like Adam than he does Jonas. We cut to Adam staring at the painting of hell that we often see him staring at. And Daniel, you're a neuroscience major. I've got to think that constantly staring at images of torture and suffering, probably not great for the psyche. Yeah, probably not super healthy. Okay, that's what I thought, and I'm glad to have the validation. <laughs> so like I said, when he turns, he looks like a young Adam now. He has all the facial disfigurements. Hannah introduces Jonas to his sister, Silja, and Jonas asks, how did you find us? Then Hannah reveals that an old woman showed up on her doorstep, a woman named Eva, and she said that she knew you were here and that you were looking for me. And Hannah says, you were right, I ruined everything, but I'm here now. Then Jonas asks Bartosz to prepare their chambers. For a moment, when he said chamber, I worried that it was some kind of a place where they were going to be held captive. But in the 1800s vernacular, chambers means bedroom or something along those lines. After Jonas sends Hannah away, we have a moment where the camera focuses on his face and it looks like his eyes are getting a little teary to me. So even though he has the hardened Adam exterior, I do think he still has feelings, which he's just sort of stifling and trying to bottle up. That night, Hannah is asleep in the same room as Silja, and Jonas walks into the room, then tells Hannah, who just woke up, that he needs to get all the pieces in place. But Silja doesn't belong here, and neither do you. Then he kills Hannah by, in the worst way possible, I feel like, or one of the worst ways, not even choking her, but just smothering her with his bare hands. So he kills Hannah and then takes Sylvia away, 
presumably to send her to the future. We know that we see Sylja in the 2050s. She's the one that welcomes Jonas to the future at the end of season one. Now, seeing Adam, seeing Jonas kill his own mother, you would think it would be an emotionally devastating thing to see. But honestly, at this point in the series and everything we're seeing, things are so bleak, it kind of felt like, sure, just pile on one more tragedy. And I was kind of just numb to it. Not a criticism of the show, but just how I'm feeling at this point, seeing these events play out. Yeah, like in comparison, I think when Katarina was killed by her mother last episode, I think, mm -hmm. like that was way more emotionally devastating, I thought, uh, right. than, than Jonas killing uh, his mother. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think when we were following the Katarina storyline, we hadn't yet floored it into bleak, dark territory. So those things still had an emotional impact. Later in the episode, we fast forward to 1920. But before we talk about that, let's talk about 2021. Jonas has now been in the future working on the God Particle for about a year. Noah and Elizabeth have been together for about a year. We see the two of them digging through the tunnels. But of course, they hit a dead end because the time tunnel is no longer active. Elizabeth asks Noah to tell her about paradise. So Noah tells her that paradise is a place that is free of pain and suffering. Everything we've ever done is forgotten there. Any pain we've ever felt is erased and all the dead live. Adam will keep his promise. The passage will open. I love this aspect of their relationship. It reminded me a lot of, of Mice and Men, where the two main characters, one of them always asks the other to tell him about the big farm they're going to own one day. But you also know that this is doomed. They're not going to get to this paradise, at least not in this cycle. So it's very touching every time Noah tells Elizabeth about this. But at the same time, it's heartbreaking because you know that Noah is incorrect. We fast forward two years to 2023. Jonas is still working with Claudia on the God Particle Machine, and they are continuing to have no luck. Claudia tries to give Jonas a pep talk. It doesn't work. Jonas says, I can't do this anymore. He goes home to hang himself from the same beam that Mikael hanged himself from years earlier. But as Jonas hangs there, young Noah shows up and cuts the rope, preventing Jonas from dying. Noah explains that because Jonas exists in the future, he cannot die. Noah hands Jonas the gun, who tries to shoot himself several times, but the gun won't fire. Then Noah takes it, shoots, and the gun fires just fine, proving his point that time will essentially protect Jonas from dying because he exists in the future and that can't be changed. Noah then informs Jonas that he and Elizabeth found the passage. He brings Jonas there and just like with Elizabeth, shows that it leads to a dead end. But Noah tells Jonas the passage will open again. Adam, i.e. you, will fulfill your promise of paradise. And then he reminds Jonas that Adam said, the two of us will become friends before you betray me. Something we heard back in season two. Now, when Jonas was hanging there, Daniel, I'm wondering, did you think for a second there was a possibility he would actually die? Yeah, I, I thought there was a chance just because the show has done a lot of things to really confuse us. Right. right? Like, I thought it was possible. All right, something's going to happen here that's going to seem like a paradox. Yeah, I thought we were going to see another reality splitting type of situation. Jonas hangs, dies, another Jonas walks in or something crazy. But that's not what happened. Thank God, too, because this was going to get really confusing. <laughs> By the way, just wanted to take a quick break to remind you, if you're enjoying this video, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. Back to the show. Fast forward 17 years to 2040. Noah and Jonas are now middle-aged. They're still working with Claudia on the machine and continuing to have no luck. That night, we see Jonas and Noah are now friends, as Adam promised. Noah asks, why do you think the machine isn't working? Maybe Claudia doesn't want it to work. And he asks Jonas, why do you trust her? 
Jonas responds with, why do you trust Adam? He lied. There is no paradise. I know you think I'm going to become Adam, but I won't. The portal works. Everything will repeat. But if I can travel back, I can change everything. My older self tried it before. We saw that. But this time is different. We changed the components of the passage. And I think here he's referring to when Jonas and Claudia went to the passage back in season two. And he told her that we'll change a grain of sand and with it, the world. Meaning at this point, Jonas thinks they changed something in the passage. So on this iteration of the cycle... Things will change. They'll be able to unravel the knot. Noah replies, Claudia told you that, right? What do you really know about her? She disappears for days. How does she know the things that she knows? She's hiding something. We can't trust her. I hope you know that. And of course, we know that Claudia is meeting with her other self from the alternate world. And that's how she knows the things she knows. And that's where she's disappearing to. I loved the back and forth here because this is a question I've had in the back of my mind throughout the three seasons. Characters seem to trust other characters implicitly with very little reason to do so, and they'll flip loyalties like that. Adam sends Jonas on a mission to save Mikkel. Well, turns out Adam was lying. I'm not supposed to save him. Then he meets Eva and at least initially listens to her. Then when he finally learns, you know what? I've got to stop trusting people. Eva kills him. So I just liked seeing someone explicitly call out, we both trust two different people and neither of us can really justify why I've chosen to put my trust in Adam or why I've chosen to put my trust in Claudia and you've chosen to put your trust in Adam. Then Elizabeth calls Noah inside and we see that she's older but she still has both eyes in good shape. Then, speaking of Claudia, Claudia meets with the other Claudia from the alternate world, and this other Claudia tells our Claudia, Jonas doesn't know the other worlds exist, she confirms that that's still the case, and she basically says, keep doing what you're doing, you keep the not alive here in your world, and I'll do the same on my world, but our Claudia is not happy. She says that she remembers what her older self told her way back when. If everything goes right, Regina will live. And she says that my older self could not have meant this, that she continues to live in suffering. Meaning right now, Regina does get to live, but in an endless knot, in an endless loop, where she suffers from cancer and then gets killed by Trant, then suffers from cancer, then gets killed by Trant. So yes, she gets to live, but it's an awful life. Claudia says there must be a way to untie the knot without destroying all life within it so Regina can live. Then she kills the other Claudia. She says that neither Eva nor Adam know the path, but I'll find it in my world or yours. Throughout the series, I've always found it a mystery. What is Claudia's motivation? Whose side is she on? Is she on anybody's side? And I think here we finally get a good understanding of her motivation. She's gone rogue. She's not working with Adam or Eva. She wants to find the middle ground where she gets to save everybody from the time knot and give them a truly happy world without wiping everybody from existence. Also, after seeing the back and forth between Noah and Jonas, which just reminds us of all these characters that are pawns in a big chess game, always under someone else's thumb, it felt really good to see somebody finally, at least seemingly, break free. I loved seeing Claudia shoot her alternate self and break free from those shackles, and I now trust Claudia. I think she's on the side of good. And if there's any hope of a happy ending to this series or even a bittersweet ending, I think it'll be thanks to Claudia. So I, I think initially I felt that same way about Claudia when we saw that scene. But I also want to like keep in mind, like it just flashed back to me that she also did kill Egon. Right. And not necessarily intentionally, but she killed her father. Right. To like protect the secret of the nuclear power plant. Um, and that... That just makes me think that who knows how pure her motivations really right. are going to be. But we also know she regrets that because she visited the younger Egon and essentially apologized for what's going to happen to him in 30 years. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can't. Uh, obviously, in this series, you will nine times out of 10 go wrong trusting anybody. But with one episode left, I am just praying for a somewhat happy ending. So maybe I'm being foolish. Anyway, after killing the other Claudia, our Claudia takes her spherical time travel and world travel device. 
takes her jacket, changes her hairstyle, and then heads to Eva's lair in the other world, our Claudia pretends to be the other Claudia. When our Claudia goes to see Eva in the other world, Eva hands her the time machine blueprints and tells her to give it to our Claudia, not knowing that this is our Claudia, but tells her to give our Claudia the time machine blueprints so she can give them to HG Tonhouse, something that we saw her do last season. From there, fast forwarding to 2041, we see Elizabeth is clearly not in the best of moods. She asks Noah to tell her about Paradise again. And as he does that, and by the way, before we even get to the next scene and what happens next, my heart was already sinking a little bit, like it does every time Elizabeth wants to hear about Paradise. But as my heart sank, we then see Elizabeth and Charlotte show up from the future. In an earlier episode this season, we saw Adam send Elizabeth and Charlotte into the God Particle, so now we learn where they were going. While Elizabeth and Noah are outside, the older Elizabeth, with Charlotte's help, go inside and steal Elizabeth's baby, which is a baby Charlotte, and they grab the four Charlotte pocket watch. From an earlier episode, we know that a couple of peculiar women brought baby Charlotte to HG Townhouse in the past, and he went on to raise her as her grandfather. So now it's confirmed Charlotte and older Elizabeth were those peculiar women that will now deliver baby Charlotte and the pocket watch to a younger townhouse. So as I said, my heart sank when Elizabeth wanted to hear about Paradise again, and then it continued to sink until it crashed to the floor and shattered. This was probably the standout moment of the episode for me, because seeing Elizabeth rob a baby from her younger self, knowing what she's about to put her younger self through, and getting to hold the child that she spent so little time with, you see her heart break, and then moments later, her younger self has to walk in and see that her baby is missing. So it's just a one-two punch of tragedy and awfulness. So Noah and Elizabeth go back inside to see that baby Charlotte is missing. Noah, furious, runs to Jonas, and he thinks that this is the betrayal Adam told him about. He said, Jonas and Noah will become friends until Jonas betrays Noah. So Noah thinks this is the betrayal. He demands to know where the baby is, where they took Charlotte. Jonas says he doesn't know, and I think in this moment he truly doesn't know. And then Noah ominously says, I wish you all the suffering in the world, and then leaves. And by the way, what a line to use on somebody. I'm going to look for the opportunity in my life to say to somebody, I wish you all the suffering in the world, Daniel. <laughs> Noah returns to Elizabeth and promises, I will find her I will bring her back I promise I will and this is a callback to last season when Noah finally meets a grown-up Charlotte he tells her I promised your mother I would bring you back one day so now we're seeing the moment when he actually made that promise so he makes a promise to Elizabeth then he picks up the Triketra notebook and leaves and so not only does Elizabeth lose her daughter at that point her baby she also is basically losing Noah like he's right. he's I mean, he's basically gone for the rest of her life. Yeah, as far as we know. Actually, yes, because then we know he ends up getting killed by Agnes. So just tragedy on top of tragedy. So he picks up the notebook, he leaves, and then we see him in 1920, the year before Jonas will arrive. Noah goes to the inn where Jonas stayed and says he's traveled a long way. Then a young Noah welcomes him and prepares chambers for this older Noah. From there, Noah visits Adam, who is now fully Adam. He's no longer the prototype young Adam. And after Noah felt betrayed by Jonas and left the cause, Adam is able to win Noah back. He says to Noah, you think I took Charlotte from you? I didn't. You were right about Claudia. She lied to all of us. And then he points out that the Triketra notebook you're carrying is missing some pages. Claudia took those pages. You need to find them. Then you can find Charlotte and ultimately Paradise. Back in season two, we see Noah kill Claudia. He finds the missing pages on her. And that's when he learns that police chief Charlotte is his daughter grown up. After Adam tells Noah about the missing pages, he tells Noah that Helga will help you find your paradise, gives him a Bible, and sends him off to the future where he'll become the 
priest Noah that we saw in seasons one and two. Before Noah parts, however, Adam says life occurs in cycles, sunrise, sunset, again and again, but this will be the last time. This will be the final cycle. We go back to 2052. We see that Claudia has grown into the older Claudia that we know. She's still working with the older Jonas, but they've finally stabilized the God particle, and it's time for Jonas to go back in time on his mission, the one that we saw when he was still the Stranger character back in seasons one and two. Older Claudia tells Jonas that he needs to take the broken time machine, the one that we saw last episode. He needs to take it to HG Townhouse, who will be able to repair it. Then he can use the machine to destroy the passage and with it, the knot. But this time you will succeed. Now, I assume in this moment that Claudia is lying to Jonas. She's sending him back, but she knows that he will fail. He'll destroy the passage, but it's not going to unravel the knot. Did you read it the same way that I did? Well, I guess I'm not sure what Claudia's motivations are at this point, mm -hmm. because who was it that when they they switched something in the barrel, right? They said they change a grain of sand, they'll right. change the universe. Was that Claudia's idea or Jonas's? That was Jonas's idea given to him by older Claudia. And then he was passing it on to younger Claudia. Yeah, so I guess I'm I'm not sure if that's a lie right. or not. <laughs> my my impression right now is that older Claudia has a plan to truly unravel the knot. But in order to do it, the cycle does need to happen one more time. So she is sending Jonas back to fail intentionally, but after that, she can enact her plan. We'll get to it in a minute, but we see her show up and talk to Adam at the end of the episode. So I think that's essentially, we've gone through the whole cycle, and hey, I'm back. Here is the real ending to the plan. So I think she's lying to Jonas when she says you'll be able to destroy the knot by closing the package. But where I think she's telling the truth is that right before he leaves, she says, Jonas, you must never lose hope. And I think that's her cryptic way of saying, I can't tell you all the details. I can't tell you the real plan, but I want to tell you that I am on the side of good. There is hope at the end of this. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. After Jonas leaves, we see Claudia rip the pages out of the Triketra notebook. Then we go into one of Dark's best montages, I think. We essentially see that when Jonas goes back in time, we get a full repeat of all the key events from the series. I thought it was a very emotional montage. We won't go through it beat by beat, but I'll shout out what I thought were a few of the best moments in the montage. First, when middle-aged Jonas goes back to his younger self's room when he needs to write follow the signal on the map. While there, he looks kind of somberly at his younger self. Just thinking about the hell that that young Jonas is about to go through. Then we see Jonas looking at his younger self at the lake with Marta, another heartbreaking moment. Then there's the moment where middle-aged Jonas is saving Magnus, Francisca, and Bartosz just before the apocalypse happens. They ask, what about Marta? And it cuts, but it doesn't cut to Marta getting shot. It cuts to a Marta already bleeding, already dying. All three of those moments I found to be, we've seen those moments, but I found them to be heartbreaking, to relive them knowing this is an endless cycle. They've gone through it so many times, and I thought this was one of the best montages in the series. Then we revisit the moment from the beginning of the episode where Marta from the alternate world was about to grab Jonas just as the apocalypse was happening to bring him to her world. Then Bartosz stopped her, and here we see where Bartosz brings her. He brings her to the post-apocalyptic alternate world, back to Eve's lair in 2052. Marta asks, why did you bring me here? Barto says, they're the only ones who will save us. So he's gone over to Eva's side. Marta says, this is all their fault. And he says, no, they are the light. Then Eva walks in and gives Marta a speech, the same speech that Adam gave Jonas. My whole life, I never thought that this moment could repeat. I never thought I could want what she wanted, i.e. I never thought that I would become Eve. And I think this is also a callback or very relevant to the line that Townhouse said, you can't will what you will. Marta says, I don't want to become Eva, but you can't control what you want. And eventually what you want will be the same thing that Eva wants. Eva says, 66 years later, I understand. Then she says, we bear the same scars and slashes Marta's face. 
So we find out how she gets that scar over her eye. And Eva says this is a memento so you never forget which side you really belong to. And you'll remember that the Marta that kills Jonas had a fresh scar on her face. So this Marta here is about to kill Jonas. Eva says choosing us is choosing life. Choosing Adam is choosing death. And at this point in the episode, I started to assume that whatever Adam did last episode where he engulfed Marta in that energy ball, I assume it didn't work. And then we cut to the prime world at 2053, and that's confirmed. The energy ball seemingly kills Marta, but then Adam is confused when he realizes he still exists. He looks at his hands and says, this can't be. Then, older Claudia shows up and says... Hello, Jonas. Now, I mentioned at the top of the video that last episode when I explained how we have three young Martas that all represent Marta from different points in the timeline, I was wrong about that. And the thing that made me realize I was wrong is the Marta that Adam kills here doesn't have a scar on her face, but she is pregnant with Jonas's child which means we have two Martas from two different timelines, and then I realize what's going on here. In the moments before the apocalypse in 2020, Marta can either grab Jonas and bring him to her world, or Bartosz can stop her. Two realities, one where Jonas eventually dies, one where he continues to exist. Well, the same is true for Marta. I think in that moment, one Marta goes in and rescues Jonas, goes on to become the Marta that Adam engulfs in the energy ball, Another Marta is stopped by Bartosz, who goes on to become the scarred Marta that kills Jonas. Did you have that one figured out, Daniel? No, not at all. Yeah, lucky you have me here. <laughs> I was on the edge of my seat listening to that How's that physics neuroscience degree treating you now? <laughs> so clearly Adam's plan didn't work. What happens from here? So you know that I'm optimistic. I'm of the opinion that older Claudia has a plan. She knew that the cycle would repeat again. She knew that Adam would try to destroy Marta and she knew it would fail. Now that it's failed, she walks in and it's time for the end game. So I'm hoping that in this moment, she's delivering on her promise to Jonas before he left on the final cycle. Claudia said to him, never lose hope. I am hoping that this is the moment where she delivers on that promise and she has some final plan that saves everyone or at least saves some of them. Whatever it is, it's at least something other than total oblivion and something other than an endless knot where everybody goes through the same awful cycle over and over. So I'm hoping for a bittersweet ending. What about you, Daniel? Any thoughts on how this is all going to wrap up? Yeah, I think I think what you described makes sense. I guess I also have a little bit of hope that maybe Eva and Marta are are also actually on the side of light. Right. Like I don't think we know for sure that they're as evil as Adam. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's hard to even say whether Adam is evil, <laughs> right? But but Adam's plan of like total oblivion as a solution didn't sound appealing. Right. Like Eva has claimed that she can fix things without oblivion, right? Right. I think so. I'm hoping maybe that's she's your goal right, anyway. But yeah, but I think you're probably right. Claudia seems like the most promising for like actually delivering a somewhat good ending. Right. Who would have thought the white devil herself is actually a white angel, perhaps? I also love how lightly you put it where you're like, total oblivion just doesn't sound that appealing. <laughs> I agree. Anyway, with that, I think we can say. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course, hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. You're especially going to want to do that because although Dark is ending, that's not the end of us talking about Dark. We're still going to do a live stream, hopefully tonight, where we'll watch the finale and then hop on to just talk about our immediate reactions, immediate thoughts after seeing the finale to Dark. Then this weekend, after digesting it a little bit, we'll do a polished review with the screenshots and everything about episode eight, just like the rest of the episodes. And after that, we'll see what we do next. But I'm sure there'll be plenty of theorizing to do, plenty to dig into, and we'll make sure to do that here. So make sure you're subscribed. You can keep up with all that and be a part of the conversation. Thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.